Good evening. On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here and those of you watching around the world on BGC TV and also those of you watching tomorrow or a month from now from the comfort of your own home on YouTube to tonight's lecture. The Leon Levy Foundation lectures in Jewish material culture with generous support from the David Berg Foundation. Before I go on, I would like to acknowledge warmly and uh, with great gratitude the presence here of uh, one of our donors, Shelby White, uh, whom we can thank for the generosity of the Leon Levy Foundation. We're very grateful. I'd also like to thank uh, Michelle Tachi and Abby Kafthal from the David Berg Foundation. Two weeks ago, when we began, I stood here and conjured the spirit of Ludwig Blau. In 1926, he published an article calling for the study of the Jewish material past. It does not, he wrote, occur to anyone to read about the Jewish monuments. And as far as I know, such a subject of study figures in no curriculum, and there exists no Jewish archaeologist in the sense of the term employed here. To America, which has at its disposal the means and the teaching staff, there is here offered a grateful field of activity, the founding of Jewish archaeology. It is well worth the exertion and the money. Blau, who was a Hungarian, his vision for the study of the Jewish past is ours, but his vision was based on the study of early Christianity, which was part itself of the Renaissance recovery of the Roman material past. He even gave his article the title, Early Christian Archaeology from the Jewish Point of View. As we have been listening to Andrea Berlin's lectures these weeks, as she has used archaeology from the things themselves to rewrite the history of Jewish daily life, culture, religion, and politics in Hellenistic and Roman Palestine, we have been watching archaeology from a Jewish point of view. As we move through the five years of this project, we will have a chance to reflect on whether and how Jewish material culture can function as a more capacious research category than Jewish archaeology or even early Christian archaeology from the Jewish point of view. Now, each of these lectures is followed by a learned response, and tonight's is offered by Azan Yadin Israel professor of Jewish studies and classics at Rutgers University. He earned his BA from the Hebrew University and his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He is the author of Scripture as Logos, Rabbi Ishmael and the Origins of Midrash, Scripture and Tradition, Rabbi Akiva and the Triumph of Midrash, and his latest book, perhaps a tie-in with the boss's new show on Broadway, is entitled the Grace of God and the Grace of Man, The Theologies of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> a fuller version of Professor Yadin Israel's response will be offered as the lunchtime talk tomorrow in this room at 12.15. I ask you now to turn off your cell phones, and I remind you to save all comments for the speaker until the Q&A period after the response. Andrea Berlin holds the James R. Wiseman Chair in Classical Archaeology at Boston University. Previously, she was the Morse <laughs> Alumni Distinguished Teaching Professor of Archaeology at the University of Minnesota, lodged in the Department of Classical and Near Eastern Studies. She has a BA in Classical and Near Eastern Studies from the University of Michigan, an MA from the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, and a PhD from the Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology of the University of Michigan. She has published two volumes on the finds at Tel Anafa in the Upper Galilee of Northern Israel, volume one on the Persian Hellenistic and Roman plain wares, and volume two on glass vessels, lamps, objects of metal, and ground stone and other stone tools and vessels. She's also been the editor, a co-editor of a volume on the First Jewish Revolt, and has published a volume on the pottery of the Second Temple period found at the first century site of Gamla in Northern Israel. She has written about the Phoenicians in Hellenistic Palestine, about evidence for cooking in Second Temple Judea, about ceramic typology from Hellenistic Lower Egypt, the limits of Romanization in the Galilee, the administrative center at Tel Kadesh in the period of Persian domination. Last week, she left us hanging by our 
hanging on the edge of our seats in Herod's Jerusalem. And today she takes us to the Great Revolt and beyond. And whether that beyond continues up to our own day is perhaps a question she will answer in the course of her lecture. Andrea Berlin. It's fantastic to see all you brave, waterproof folks. Thank you again, Peter, for a beautiful introduction and for this opportunity and to the uh, supporters of this program and to all of my um, sadly just temporary but still uh, happy Bard uh, family. Now it's been an honor to be here and I've really enjoyed myself, so thank you very much. What are we talking about when we talk about history. It is not simply what happened. It is more like a conversation that we have with ourselves about the past. My favorite formulation is by T. Kyler Young, who says, history is what the present thinks about the past. I do not say that history is what happened in the past. Rather, history is what a living society does with the past. Events that are not studied and incorporated into a culture's vision of itself are not part of history. They happened, yes, but they are not part of history until an historian with a specific purpose related to his or her own time and culture picks up those facts and uses them. History is what a living society does with the past. This nicely explains what the authors of 1st and 2nd Maccabees and the 1st century CE historian Josephus were up to. It helps explain why for almost 2,000 years there was almost no historical writing about the Maccabean revolt and the Jewish revolt against Rome, and why over the past 100 years there have been scores of scholarly books and articles about those events in the era between them. It may explain why you were interested enough to come here tonight. It definitely explains what I want to understand. I want to understand something that when phrased in plain language sounds baffling. What would persuade a group of people who live under the dominion of a large, heavily armed power to rebel against that power. I am talking about people who see themselves as a unity in some crucial way, who know they lack the numbers, political clout, international alliances, and military heft to challenge that dominating power, and they still decide on separatist <laughs> defiance. History is what a living society does with the past. Tonight our focus is on Israel in the first century CE. But of course, there are many other such entities and episodes, past and present. My questions are the same that modern historians, political scientists, and sociologists ask. How far back should we go to understand which aspects are relevant and which incidental? When do cultural differences become divisions? Which divisions do people live with? And which blow up? And the payoff question, why? <coughs> Two weeks ago, we began our examination of these questions in the second century BCE, a period that may now seem like <laughs> ancient history. As in almost all eras in this region, people of different ethnicities and affiliations lived here, Tyrians and Sidonians, Idumeans and Nabataeans, Samaritans and Judeans. Some claimed a specific identity as Apollophanes, leader of the Sidonian colony in Marissa. Others acted out a key feature, as both Hegesander and Deliah did, by making personal dedications at Samaria and Mount Gerizim. Others carried names that communicated an ethnic or cultural attachment, such as the Edomite Kosnatanos, nephew of Apollophanes. Two other features of this era, side-by-side -side coexistence, as for example, 
in the adjacent sanctuaries of the Panaeon and the high place in, at Don, and a wide embrace of cosmopolitan culture via houses with the same styles of interior decor, via Greek styles and subjects, such as this figure of Heracles from Samaria, and this ivory box with Zeus as an eagle and Ganymede from Jerusalem, via Mediterranean goods, imported wine, fancy drinking cups, colorful glazed dishes. But beginning in the late second century BCE and continuing over the next few generations, we watched as the fabric of commonality frayed and differences became political division. John Hyrcanus destroyed Marissa, Samaria, and Nyssa, Beth Shan, and the Samaritan sanctuary of Mount Gerizim. He instituted a hierocracy, a temple state centered in Jerusalem with new festivals and rituals, including a new household-based ritual of purifying immersion. His son, Alexander Janaeus, seized Gaza, besieged Tyre, attacked cities across the Jordan. Judeans moved to Galilee, built new villages, and settled into established ones, as at Gamla, where the building of two mikvaot indicates that some here also practiced the new immersion ritual. In 63 BCE, Pompey dismantled the Hasmonean polity and restored the political map of earlier times. Five years later, Mattathias Antigonus, a Hasmonean prince who had been hostage in Rome, returned to Judea. He spent the next 20 years trying to unseat his uncle and reestablish an independent Jewish state. When put in power briefly by the Parthians, Antigonus created a new Jewish symbol by issuing coins with the menorah and showbread platter. In Judea, people began using a new locally made oil lamp for weekly Shabbat lamp lighting. I'm going to go back one. That was wrong. Material evidence suggests a split between Jews. Supporters of Antigonus were in Judea alone. Jews in the north did not use his coins or the new Judean style lamps. At Gamla, the mikvaot went out of use, and none were built in other settlements up here. People used imported dishes and mold-made lamps, prepared meals, and Mediterranean-style casseroles. They lived within the ambit of Mediterranean cosmopolitanism, of Meliager of Gadara's single homeland. In 37 BCE, Antigonus was publicly executed in Antioch. The last Hasmonean Skion was dead. Herod took control of a multicultural kingdom whose borders followed those of the extinguished Hasmonean polity, with governance divided between himself as head of state and in Jerusalem, a high priest as leader of the Jews. Over the next 30 years, Herod completed a series of colossal projects. He built a new port city Caesarea, three large temples to Roma and Augustus at Caesarea, Samaria, and up north at the Panaeon, an enormous new temple complex in Jerusalem, and something like 10 palatial compounds, almost all in Judea. His guests included Jewish elites and priests, many of whom recreated his Mediterranean-infused style in their own homes multicolored pattern painted walls, mosaic floors, banquet rooms for elaborate dinner parties, imported wine, flashy dishes, glass drinking cups. They built private bath suites with mikvaot, showing their adoption of this still new and not yet widespread Hasmonean Orthodox practice. The year is 4 BCE. The king is dead. Unimaginable. He ruled 33 years. An entire generation has known only him as their leader. He has been wholly powerful, executing any who angered him or aroused suspicion. Most immediate family members, including a wife and three sons, Rabbis, civic leaders, servants, friends and allies, elderly and young, variously by torture, drowning, stoning, burning, with pseudo-evidence, sham trials, 
mass roundups. And yet so many averted their gaze, noting instead his generous civic benefactions, stunning constructions, and mostly a welcome political quietude, the pragmatic trade-offs of tyranny and celebrity. His funeral was a spectacle, a procession halfway across Judea from Jericho to Herodium. He lay on a golden bier covered with purple cloth, a diadem and golden crown on his head. Following were his entire military forces in full war regalia and 500 slaves carrying spices. And the tomb a man-made mountain among the Judean hills, made distinct by a high, gleaming white monument easily seen from Jerusalem. It communicates both personal bravado and enduring authority. Even the location speaks, the spot where Herod first defeated Antigonus in battle. On the border between Judea and Idumea, Herod's birthplace and family power base, and also a region conquered by John Hyrcanus just a generation or a century earlier. With this tomb, Herod overwrites past events with more recent ones. He makes geography an accessory to history. Now, as he stipulated in his will, his three surviving sons are in control. The eldest, Herod Archelaus, oversees Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. The next eldest, Herod Antipas, oversees Perea across the Jordan and Galilee, his father's old stomping grounds. The younger, Herod Philip, has all of Galanitis, the high plateau that runs east and north of the Sea of Galilee. Consider the psychology of this moment. When Antigonus was killed over 30 years earlier, the vision that he promoted did not disappear. An independent Jewish state was still a living memory. Many could imagine its reemergence. For them, Herod's rule will have been a stone in their throat, hard to swallow. But others will have counseled patience, pointing to the many advantages that Herod's rule brought the Jews. With Caesarea, the country finally has a seaworthy harbor. The large ships that had gone only to Tyre and Alexandria now also bring people and goods from the Mediterranean right to Judea's doorstep. Herod's relations with Augustus were so close that the emperor's son-in-law and chief counsel Agrippa personally visited, and he sent Roman engineers and materials to facilitate grand building projects. And that relationship meant that the Romans left Judea alone. In the province of Syria, just to the north, three legions stand ready in case of attack or rebellion. But during the years of Herod's rule, none entered Judea. And what about the new temple? Herod ensured there was no grander edifice to a people's god than that built for Yahweh in Jerusalem. He expanded the platform to create a setting five times larger than the Acropolis in Athens. Outside are enormous pools in which dusty travelers bathe, large mikvaot for pilgrims to purify themselves before entering the sacred space. Ascent is via beautiful stone staircases, broad on the south, high on the west, with entry ceilings finished with exquisitely carved interlocking panels and rosettes. Atop the mount, one sees east as far as the Dead Sea, and in the west can admire the newly fortified citadel. A grand portico extends across the platform's entire southern width, a building so vast that it needs 162 columns to support the roof. And those columns are so wide, it takes three men with arms extended to encircle each one. A temple and setting such as this proclaims to the world the power of the Jewish God and elevates his people to an equal standing. Well, the temple may impress. It may proclaim what it will. Jews are not the masters of their fate. Herod was king, but he was also a tool for conveying the authority of Rome. The proof is in those temples to Roma and Augustus. 
The two at Caesarea and Samaria are raised high on man-made platforms like the temple in Jerusalem, with columns so tall they overpower the sun. The third up north at the Penaeon is more modest, but it too offends. A new building in a Greek sanctuary, while the ancient Israelite shrine down the road at Don remains untended. As Herod's sons take control over his territories, and also over all the people who live here, it is a moment of transition and expectation. In Jerusalem, immediately there are riots. In Herod's final days of illness, two rabbis, one Judas, the other Matthias, had urged their students to pull down the golden eagle attached to the temple's main gate. They succeeded, were apprehended, brought to Herod, who ordered them all burnt alive, students and teachers alike. Within days, Herod too was dead, and Archelaus king. It is Passover. The city is full. And when Archelaus appears in the temple courts, he is confronted by a mob who demand retribution and hurl stones at his bodyguard, killing several. Archelaus sends out his forces, who, according to Josephus, kill 3,000 and force everybody else back to their homes. Archelaus himself leaves for Rome, as does his brother Antipas, both to make their case to Augustus for control, much as Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, the sons of Janaeus, had done with Pompey 60 years earlier. But troubles continue in Jerusalem. Josephus tells us that an immense multitude ran together out of Galilee and Idumea and Jericho and Perea. They distributed themselves, one at the north of the temple, another at the south, and the third at the palace on the west. They lay round about the Romans on every side and besieged them. Pagan items in the temple, hostile forces on the mount, leaders who promote foreign ways and owe their position to outside powers, Jewish defenders all around. Does this sound familiar? Meanwhile, Herod Philip has moved to his new realm in the Northeast, a wide open territory roamed mostly by shepherds. There are no cities, just a few long settled towns such as Gamla, but a king needs a capital. Herod Philip chooses the spot of the old rural sanctuary to Pan, which his father had modernized with his temple to Roma and Augustus. The son lays out a new city in the plain below and names it after himself, Caesarea Philippi. Excavations here have uncovered the foundations of a colonnaded street aligned with his father's temple, now effectively the city's primary cult locale, a Capitolium, like in Rome. To demarcate his new city, and perhaps also ha as homage, Herod Philip builds a second temple at the southern edge facing towards visitors coming from Galilee. It rises on a hill today called Horvat Omrit, just on the road from that old villa at Tel Anafa, which is now a border post occupied by a small group of soldiers. Excavations at Omrit have shown that there was already a shrine on this spot, which Herod Philip simply enclosed within the foundations of his impressive new temple. The podium is 13 feet high, 75 feet long, 48 feet wide. Across the front are four tall columns, each with an elaborate Corinthian capital. Together, podium, columns, and capitals support a gabled roof 60 feet high. The temple looms on its hilltop over the valley below and sends an unmistakable message. You now enter a Roman city. In the year one, Herod Philip establishes a mint and he advertises his new temple on his coins. They are bronzes, small change, with wide distribution throughout both his realm and also that of his brothers to the west. Residents of many of these cities Gamla, Bethsaida, Gush Chalav, and others are Galilean Jews. Every time they handle one of these coins, two temples come to their minds, that of Herod Philip at Omrit and that of his father at the Penaeon. The coins offer a steady reminder of the political and cultural dominance of Rome. 
It is just now. In the early first century BCE, soon after the accession of Herod's sons, that something notable happens in the material record. Actually, a series of notable things happen. A new type of lamp and vessels in stone appear at sites in Judea, Idumea, Perea, and Galilee. In some settlements in Galilee, we see a new type of public building, synagogues. Mikvaot now occurs throughout Judea, Galilee, and in Idumea and Perea. Finally, in Galilee, imported dishes and lamps disappear, and in Jerusalem, elaborate personal burial monuments are built. I'm going to present the evidence for all of these, but first I should say, so much simultaneous change in people's physical surroundings and material goods is unusual. I'm not talking about one or two new items appearing or disappearing, that's common. What happens now, an abrupt simultaneous shift on multiple material fronts, that's strange. It is a phenomenon, a category of evidence in and of itself. Such quick and wide change indicates a new sensibility in which material goods have taken on a kind of communicative force. What are they communicating and to whom? Before we can answer that, we need to look at each of these remains themselves, what they are, where they show up, what they replace or allow. We'll start with the three things that now appear everywhere. For 200 years, lamps had been made in two-piece molds domed on the top with a long, narrowing spout. Those made on the coast carried more decoration. Those made in Judea were simpler, but the technique and the form and the idea were the same. Now, Jerusalem potters create a new type, one that copies the shape of a contemporary Roman mold-made discus lamp with a low, round body and a flat top. The body of the new lamp, the new Jerusalem-made lamps, that is, is made on a wheel, the nozzle formed and added by hand, and the sides of the nozzle are pared away with a knife or some kind of sharp tool so as to better simulate the contours of the nozzle on the Roman discus lamps. But whereas all of the Roman discus lamps carry images, which would have been easily added to this new type, the new lamps are completely undecorated. They have absolutely no design. They are purposefully plain. These new lamps replace all others at Jewish settlements in Judea, Perea, and Galilee. Petrographic clay analysis of samples from Jerusalem, Qumran, Masada, and Gamla indicate that all were made of the same clay, and that clay is from Jerusalem. So either people purchased their lamps from there or they acquired them via peddlers purposefully. Now, lamps may illuminate the dinner table, a dark corner, a work area. But I believe that the ubiquity and specificity of these lamps indicate a new emphasis on the weekly rite of lighting lamps for the Sabbath. Several first century CE Roman writers remark on this practice in regards to Jews in Rome. I believe that those lamps that Judean potters started making around 40 BCE were also intended for Shabbat lamp lighting, but those lamps did not travel. In Galilee, people continued using mold-made, decorated, imported lamps. Now and suddenly, all Jewish households use this new, distinctive, simple, plain, Jerusalem-made lamp. In many of the same places that the new plain lamp appears, there are now also vessels made of soft limestone. Two are brand new forms, deep wide mouth jars and large handled mugs with chiseled exteriors. I agree with the scholar Shimon Gibson that these were intended to be used for washing hands as a rite of purification. The jars could hold water, the mug could be dipped inside, the ones with two handles serving the especially fastidious. The idea must be based on an event recounted in the book of Exodus in which Moses is commanded to place water 
in front of the altar for Aaron and his sons to wash before making a sacrifice. But until this moment, there has been no material evidence that any such purification rites took place outside of temple sacrifices. The sudden appearance of these new jars and mugs suggest that it is only now that people expand this ritual into domestic space and into activities beyond the temple. Support for an understanding of the ritual of hand washing as new comes from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The authors each recount an episode where one or more men, variously identified as scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, take Jesus to task because neither he nor his followers wash their hands before eating. The author of Luke also records Jesus' response. You Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, yet inside you are full of greed. These are accounts of doctrinal disagreement, the sort that arises when old texts are read in new ways and not everybody agrees with the new understanding. In this regard, the distribution of workshops and specific forms is of interest. First workshops, we know of six large ones, five directly around Jerusalem and one in Galilee near Nazareth, and about 10 small house-based workshops in Judea and Galilee. The concentration around Jerusalem is notable, as is the absence of either workshops or stone vessels in Samaria. As to forms, the overwhelming majority of vessels made and found are the mugs. In most localities, they are the only type of vessel found. Other forms, such as trays, large bowls, small dishes, which are suitable for table use, few, a few, occur in settlements in Galilee and Perea, but most are only known from Jerusalem. Many are exact copies of fancy glazed and metal vessels, just made of demonstrably local material, in the most essential way. Stone vessels represent the land from which they are made. They are material emblems of territory. Synagogues. We have positive evidence for at least two synagogues in Judea by the mid to late first century BCE. One in Jerusalem, attested by the inscription you see here, discovered in 1913 in a cistern south of the Temple Mount. It refers to a man named Theodotus, who was a third generation archisunagogus. There is he, and he is the son, and then the grandson of uh, archisunagogoi, which means head of synagogue. The Greek script of the inscription has been dated to the first century CE, but since Theodotus' father and grandfather also held the title, this should mean that there was a synagogue already in Jerusalem from around the middle of the first century BCE or so. The small synagogue excavated at Um El Um Dan, ancient Modi'in, is probably also around this date. Now, in the early first century CE, we have evidence for synagogues in the north as well. Two that have been excavated at Gamla and Magdala, and three referred to in the Gospels at Nazareth, Capernaum and Tiberias. Everywhere except Tiberias, which was a city, these synagogues were the first public, communal, non-domestic facilities in their respective locales. They will have functioned as places to study, to deliberate, to meet weekly, to read scripture, but I would point out that none of these practices require a purpose-built structure. In other words, in addition to their utility, these synagogues, as any public building, are a kind of social statement, an announcement of the existence and interests of their builders and users. To this point, it is worth noting that the synagogues at Um El Umdan, Gamla, and Magdala are very small. The Gamla synagogue could accommodate only about a third of its town's estimated male population, and that at Magdala is even more compact. Scholars are split on how many people really use these facilities. That's a big issue in its own right. Books are written about this. I'm going to leave that particular issue aside right now and instead add what I think is an undeveloped angle to this picture, which is political. Recall 
the other proximate major architectural statements in the North at this time. Herod Phillips' new temple advertised on all his coins, and soon thereafter, Herod Antipas' founding of the new city of Tiberias, named for the successor of Augustus and intended as a pendant to Caesarea Maritima. These were architectural proclamations of the permanence of Roman authority and culture. The synagogues are rejoinders in the same constructed language. With them, Galilean Jews assert a right to their own demarcated spaces and venues. An understanding of these synagogues as political assertions is sensationally reified by the discovery in the synagogue at Magdala of a large stone base, probably a support for a table that would have held scrolls, carved with a menorah. Remember that the depiction of the menorah is itself a new thing. It first appeared only on the coins of Mattathias Antigonus, the last Hasmonean king. It is still very rare far from a common trope or symbol. It is instead a politically evocative link to the time before Herod, to a vision of an autonomous Jewish state that, as recounted in 1 Maccabees, had its beginnings in what must feel like a similarly contentious and schismatic time. It is only now that mikvaot become a regular feature of the Jewish domestic landscape. At Gamla, two are built, one just outside the new synagogue and another in an oil pressing facility. At Magdala, there are several in large houses near the synagogue, and elsewhere they appear in Galilee as well, at Arbel, at Kana, Yodfat, and also at the rural estate of Ramat Hanadiv on the Carmel Range. We find them next to oil presses in the countryside of Judea, Perea, and Idumea. They are suddenly and dramatically ubiquitous. How can we understand these new material goods and spaces? With these remains, the lamps, stone vessels, synagogues in mikvaot, Jews create connections to one another, to the land, and to Jerusalem. They create a palpable Jewish sensibility, one available to all, rich and poor. It is a sensibility to be enacted beyond the temple one that allows people to infuse homes and everyday lives with a kind of priestly ideology. Jacob Milgram explains that ideology as to a, a desire to advance the holy into the realm of the common and thereby enlarge the realm of the pure. I have named this new purposeful home-based practice household Judaism. Household Judaism is, at its heart, behavior that is a kind of social binding. It is not, in and of itself, radical. Adopting its practice does not suggest that people are looking for a fight. But the timing and its spread are not coincidences. Household Judaism appears shortly after Herod's death and the accession of his sons. It allows people to use material goods to enact an identity that is singular rather than nested, whose edges are hard rather than permeable. This behavior and the goods that enable it in turn help create a visibly delineated world. And in this world, a new generation comes of age. With that observation, let us turn to the last two phenomena that we see on the ground at this time. In the early first century CE, imported goods disappear from Galilee. No more do people acquire Aegean wine, red slip plates and bowls, decorated mold-made lamps. Instead, along with the Jerusalem-made plain lamps, stone mugs, and occasional other stone vessels, they now use only small plain dishes without color or decoration. This is most dramatically illustrated at Gamla, where several generations had used imported goods, but now suddenly stop. Now the only vessels large enough for serving food are the cooking pots and casseroles in which it was prepared. The mode of dining is almost ascetic. The disappearance of imports in Jewish Galilee is strange because they still show up at sites inland, for example, Caesarea Philippi, 
the military guard post at Tel Anafa, and more to the point, in the homes of Jerusalem's wealthy elites, where both the amount and variety of imported goods now actually rise. I draw two conclusions from this. First, the absence in Galilee is purposeful. It's a choice. It's not a necessity. And second, this has nothing to do with halakha, with any legal prohibition, because if that were the case, there would be no imported goods now in the priestly homes in Jerusalem. Galileans must have some reason for making this choice now, and I believe that it is connected with the last material phenomenon of this moment. The last phenomenon is the appearance now of so-called display tombs. That's not my term. It's a term that's already in the scholarly literature, and it's a misnomer. Display tombs are not actually tombs. They are elaborate monuments built over typical, simple, rock-cut burial caves, which is what you're looking at here. Let me quickly describe these typical cave tombs so you can appreciate the impact of what's new. They are carved directly into the hillsides with a plain courtyard in front, but no architectural elaboration or above ground standing marker. Inside are multiple slots called kohim, what we saw as loculi and marissa, often labeled with family names, benches for primary interments, a pit for the secondary collection of bones, such as that you see in the lower right. There are quantities of basic household items, jars, cooking pots, saucers and bowls, perfume bottles, lamps. These suggest funerary meals and perhaps a belief that the dead required sustenance, but also a shared sense that the departed did not require special luxury. From such remains, we should imagine a family gathered in the courtyard as in a house, the body laid out as if on a bed, water and cooked food at hand, a sense of continuity with family life. This meshes quite well with the contemporary description of a Jewish funeral from Josephus. He says, the pious rites which the law provides for the dead do not consist of costly obsequies or the erection of conspicuous monuments. The funeral ceremony is to be undertaken by the nearest relatives. All who pass while a burial is proceeding share the mourning of the family after the funeral, the house and its inhabitants must be purified. Rock-cut tombs are numerous and standardized. So far, over 800 have been excavated just around Jerusalem alone and another 100 in the Judean countryside. Display tombs, or more accurately, elaborate monuments, are more restricted. They are only in Jerusalem. There are less than 40 in Toto. They are essentially new at this time. We know of one from the time of Alexander Janaeus named Jason's tomb that you see here. Its similarity to the Hasmonean family funerary monument suggests that its builder was a relative or a member of that court. There follows a gap of a few generations before we see other such monuments. Display tombs differ from rock-cut tombs in three significant ways. They have high standing markers, ornate facades, and large courtyards with benches, features that attract and keep attention and accommodate an audience. Embellishments include high podia, stepped entryways, columns, moldings, frieze courses, pediments, and acroteria, pyramidal or hat-shaped roofs. These tombs are positioned in places on the way to or from the Temple Mount and are usually pretty easily seen from it, such as these in the Kidron Valley. Imagine a funeral in such a setting. The facade is backdrop and stage set with the mourners and audience gathered in front. Josephus reports that in his time, the funerals of Judean elites had come to include newly opulent rites, such as processions and public panegyrics, akin to the obsequies of Roman patrician funerals. In such settings, the wealthiest Jerusalemites distinguished themselves. Their tombs, locations, standing markers, scenic facades, and enlarged gathering areas communicated their status and significance, not just now, but ever after. Watching or hearing about such a funeral, who would a Judean or visiting Galilean be reminded of? There can be only one referent, Herod, whose obscenely enormous burial monument is ever visible 
on the Jerusalem horizon. The same Herod, whose rule began with the defeat of true Hasmonean royalty, whose kingdom replaced the Jewish state and polluted it with the construction of temples to Roma and Augustus, whose will handed that state over to his sons, those same sons who have now extended their father's offensiveness with their own constructions of Roman temples and palaces. Now in Judea, the actions of Herod Archelaus have brought about a reprise of the very events against which Judah Maccabee himself rebelled and won. There are not many places and eras in our history that can match early first century Judea and Galilee as a cauldron of incompatible answers to fundamental questions about the place of the individual within the human-made social fabric. To whom or what do we owe our highest allegiance and loyalty? What are we owed in return for that allegiance? If that social contract is broken, how should we respond? In Judea and Galilee in the early first century CE, the social contract broke. The actions and choices of Herod's sons were the last straw. Although far from the most egregious, they were too much for the Jewish body politic, even though its members all subscribed to an essential sensibility manifested in the practice of household Judaism. At the beginning of tonight's talk, I asked, which divisions do people live with and which blow up? Here we are. Because what we see on the ground is a people who in many ways act as a singular whole but who are riven by divides of class and political ideology. When that social contract breaks, those divides give rise to multiple incompatible responses, sectarian visions of apocalyptic ends, Judas of Gamla's call to revolt against the onus of Roman control, Jesus of Nazareth's advocacy on behalf of the poor, dispossessed and harassed by priests and the wealthy. Judas of Gamla's call to fight for a revived Jewish state is a reaction to the new Roman procurator, Quirinius, who in the year six imposes a census on Judea. Following the script of 1 Maccabees, Judas and his followers punish Jews who comply by burning their houses and stealing their cattle. He founds a new party, which Josephus calls the Zealots and whose growth he traces over generations. It is Judas's great nephew, Eliezer ben Yair, who commands the last group of defenders at Masada. For Jesus of Nazareth, a Galilean contemporary of Judas, Rome is not the enemy. To an order that Jews must pay taxes deriving from a Roman imposed census, he offers a response intended to smooth over the divide. Render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. The parables in the Synoptic Gospels make his position clear. The greater harm are the actions of priests and elites, and the unbridgeable divide that has grown between wealthy and poor. The foe is more proximate than Rome, the solution less militant than revolt and the goal of another order, not a kingdom here on earth, but one on high and everlasting. When we talk about the Jewish revolt, what do we mean by the? There were so many arguments between Jews about where the real problem lay, against whom to make a stand, even what to stand for. We don't need to speculate about whether a united group could have prevailed against Rome. There was never any chance of that. But if history is for lessons, then we can learn how to recognize when it sends up a warning flare. It took about 200 years to develop the divided, hardened, essentialist conditions that made a decision to revolt inevitable. That might be enough time to spot similar danger signs 
before they coalesce into a similar sort of moment. History is what a living society does with the past. In the end, we all do history. We pull particular moments from the past to better discern and understand the present. But you know, there's a lot of past to choose from. So let me close by offering one final snapshot. We'll move past the destruction of the temple in 70, about three generations ahead. The year is 150, calm days. The Roman governor lives in Caesarea, inherit the great's old palace, now refurbished and enlarged. Jerusalem is a modern city, arched entry gates, wide colonnaded streets, temples to Venus and Jupiter. Jews live throughout the land, with Galilee especially densely settled, anchored by two beautiful cities, Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee and Sepphoris, closer to the Mediterranean. Both house famous rabbinic schools. Students come here from all over. As elsewhere throughout Roman Palestine, people live surrounded by the material accoutrement of Mediterranean culture. Colonnaded streets, stone-built theaters, homes with well-appointed dining rooms, exquisite mosaic floors, tables set with lovely imported dishes. Nobody gets to pick their generation, but everybody gets to pick how to stand to the past, which parts to focus on, which to ignore. For these Jews, the revolts, that against Rome and that of the Maccabees, are old stories. They don't seem interested in repeating. They live in the present, just like that old poet, <coughs> Melly Ager. You know, he came from Gadara, just across the river. Nice city, stone theater, colonnaded streets, beautiful villas. Remember that little poem of his? I think it could work for today, too. How did it end? I am Melly Ager, yes. And what of Syrian? Stranger, marvel not. We inhabit a single homeland, the world. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you, Andrea, for that fascinating uh, talk. I, I don't know if you want to bring the lights up. I have, I'm a simple uh, textually trained scholar. <laughs> I have no images. I have nothing with which to wow you, so I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to have to up my, uh, my visual game, um, no doubt. So first of all, uh, after thanking Andrea, thank you also to uh, the Bar Graduate Center, to Dean Miller, to everyone uh, for this event and for the invitation you've extended me. Um, I do have to start with an apology. Um, Dean Miller mentioned that this was uh, a five-year project, but I really only have a few pages. Um, <laughs> anyway, I won't be more than 13 or 14 months um, in my comments. Okay. Um, so uh, Professor Berlin has presented us with a fascinating um, survey of, um, that contains two distinct themes. The main theme, the core of her presentation, um, is a meticulous analysis of the material changes preceding the Great Revolt. The lamps, the burial customs, uh, the stone vessels, patterns of importation or lack of importation, um, all of them uh, woven into a rich tapestry that promises insight into the lived life um, of the Jewish communities of the day. More specifically, she charts a shift, a tectonic shift, really in terms of the, the results, um, in the, the sociological and the political landscape. These are material manifestations of the uh, identity, the shifting identity of the Jews of the day uh, all leading up to, again, the, the revolt. Um, 
The second theme that was touched on in the introduction and in the conclusion um, is what do we do um, from a disciplinary point with these, uh, with these <coughs> changes? In other words, uh, how do we turn them into meaningful history and what do we do with that history? And here I will say that we have a, a, a bit of a scholarly divide. The archaeologists um, tend toward the comfort of the tangible, whereas uh, textually trained uh, scholars such as myself will, gra more, will gravitate towards uh, more abstract questions. <laughs> so uh, true to form, that's what I'm doing. In other words, I'm going to pick up on the elements that um, were only kind of touched on more briefly. Um, and here I think it's worth distinguishing between uh, two fields that may be relevant to this conversation. Uh, Professor Berlin spoke about, uh, about history and uh, noted, I mean, I think this is uh, completely uh, correct, I'm not disputing anything that she said, uh, noted that history is what the um, present makes of the past and that, you know, simply something having happened in the past does not in make itself historical um, until a historian makes it such. The clearest evidence for that is a shift in um, 20th century um, historiography uh, toward something that would have been basically unthinkable to earlier generations of historians, such as the history of the everyday. In other words, the idea that you would take um, the lives of everyday people and study them as uh, the subject of history, rather than monumental military and political events um, is, a, is an interesting demonstration of how the historian makes it history rather than it simply happening in the past making it history. Um, however, at least within the Jewish world, history in any kind of strict disciplinary sense uh, has a very short shelf life in, in the ancient world. Uh, after Josephus, um, there really aren't any Jewish historians, um, maybe until the Renaissance, depending on how you, how, how you count, depending on how broadly you want to define historians, uh, and maybe until significantly later. So um, Professor Berlin noted that history is what the present thinks about the past, but I um, want to add that it's not the only discipline that's, that, that involves how the present thinks about the past. Um, there's another called uh, collective memory. Uh, collective memory is the way in which uh, communities generally think of the past, and rather than being manifest in historical studies or, or um, historical treatises, it finds expression in things like monuments to past events, um, the names people give their children, uh, holidays that commemorate uh, the past. Professor Berlin has provided a fascinating uh, material basis for understanding the Great Revolt. I want to suggest that an examination of the Great Revolt in later Jewish sources, in other words, its afterlife, uh, may be better approached through the study of Jewish collective memory rather than uh, history proper. Thank you. Thanks to both of our speakers, and we now have some time for questions. There's a hand in the back. I'd like to ask my first question to the respondent, Professor. Uh, yet I, I've studied some of your work on the of Rebbe Yishmael. I know what That's a great, another talk, yes. what a great <laughs> textual scholar you are. So my question is, and then I'll turn it to uh, Professor Berlin. Um, Tractate Yerdaya records, I believe, uh, how the, uh, the rule for washing one's hands on bread is from uh, a much earlier time, the first temple uh, period of King Solomon. So do we have other texts that uh, challenge this? And then my question to Professor Berlin, do we have archaeology that contradicts this, supports it, or we just don't have any archaeology about a first temple, um, you know, recording civilian washing of hands, non-temple-based, 
uh, ritual before the eating bread at meals? Well, I can answer first because okay. it's a very fast answer. So the question for those of you is, do we have, there's textual, possibly textual evidence that hand washing could be much, much earlier as a, as a legal stipulation? Is there material evidence for its practice? And the answer is no. <laughs> All right, so um, well, that was quick. <laughs> um, archaeologists have sometimes very clear-cut answers. Uh, textual critics. Not so much. Um, well, I would say that the, I, I obviously couldn't say anything definitive you know, without exploring this question a little bit more fully. Um, but I will say that um, there is a work, interesting work done, for example, on, on the way rabbi, on the way, you, on, when you say the tract that you're talking about, the Mishnah, um, I'm just clarifying that, you know, that, that we're referring to the Mishnah, we're referring to, uh, you know, an early third century text that contains traditions uh, that are earlier, late second, through the second century, and maybe some from the late first century. So, um, there is interesting work on how rabbinic sources seek to anchor certain traditions in earlier, in earlier um, sources. Now, I would say that just on the face of it, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even be able to come up with any kind of transmission mechanism or other source of information that would allow us to assume that the rabbis have solid historical knowledge about First Temple, you know, about, about the, 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 the mechanics of First Temple, rituals such as hand washing. I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, straightforward biblical rules about sacrifice and so forth, you know, that, that's one thing. But if you're saying that, that, that there are rabbinic claims about that, it would even, we would have to first ask, what possibly could be the basis, in other words, the basis that we would accept um, as historically legitimate for such a uh, for such a rabbinic claim? Just to clarify, we would be talking about the transmission of information that would have happened for, from us today, from before Columbus sailed the ocean. We're about eight hundred, like eight hundred years earlier. What was happening in Jewish today? history? Hmm? A blink of an eye, with maybe two eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's co that's collective memory for you. <laughs> so if I could just jump in, since since our speakers have already, in a sense, um, pointed to the 800-pound gorilla in the room, uh, it's time perhaps to put the cat amidst the pigeons uh, in this beastery. <laughs> with the gorilla. I mean, why <laughs> this this question about the hand washing is an interesting one because, in fact, couldn't one view the Mishnah? produced second, third century as an attempt to create a collective memory where none had existed before, right? Looking back to a genealogy that is otherwise unprovable through any documentation. So presumably, collective memory could be created by material culture as well. Why see it as only textual? And then for Professor Berlin, to take up the question of collective memory uh, from later periods, from late antiquity, how does the story you've been telling over these weeks get processed through the material remains of Jews in late antiquity? So, so, so let me say two things briefly since I was, the question, the first question was to me. I'm just, first of all, I definitely, I, 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 I definitely um, want to clarify that I don't think that um, collective memory is textual um, because, I, and I think I mentioned that, for example, monuments, monuments or uh, 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 you know, uh, grave sites, um, all kind. Of, those are those are physical. Those are physical, archaeological, monumental um, edifices. What's significant is that they're not historical. In, in other words, our interest in them is not that they're evidence of, say, a great battle. You know, if we see. I don't know what. You know, if you go to Washington, you see how you know how Lincoln is commemorated. It's not that we didn't know who Lincoln was and this shows us new historical material. It's that we are now given a uh, kind of vista into how a particular generation and, or, and that artist and the, and, the, and the committee that sanctioned the work 
envisioned Lincoln in this case. Or so, but would you say that the Mishnah is a project of creating collective knowledge? Yeah. So I'll 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 say two quick sentences about the Mishnah. And then they're going to be, and then I'll, um, I'll run for that the hills. <laughs> I'll say two quick sentences and then head for the hills. Um, there's a generally uh, assumed narrative that after 70, in other words, after 70 CE, the destruction of the Second Temple, the leadership of the Jewish people transitions from the priesthood to the rabbis. Um, that is not completely incorrect. In other words, eventually that does happen. Uh, it is unlikely that the authors of the traditions preserved in the Mishnah knew that to be the case. Uh, for basically the, the most simple reason is that the temple had already been destroyed once uh, and was rebuilt. So the destruction of the temple, there was no reason to, there's no reason to think that the Jews living in the generations after 70 knew that we would be standing here, you know, uh, two th a little under 2,000 years later, and still not have a temple. Um, there's, sorry? Nothing, I'm sorry, I'll no. wait. Okay, so in other words, there, it's very important not to um, kind of retroject what we already, we already know the outcome. We already know that there was no temple, and that they really were going to become, uh, there was gonna be something formed called rabbinic Judaism, However, it's a very complicated process, most, most basically because there's no such thing as rabbis in, in, in the Bible. You know, there are no rabbis in the Bible. There are no synagogues uh, in the Bible. There's no, the, 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 the ritual of collective prayer, of, of a fixed liturgy. None of those things have any biblical basis. They have to be kind of built up in a certain way, and that didn't happen within a generation or two. So, our tendency to think of the Mishnah as kind of a text that was forged by the new leadership. In other words, that it was aimed at the broad Jewish populace may be anachronistic. So the Mishnah certainly has elements in it that involve collective memory. In other words, it, it's, but it's the collective memory of a very particular group and may not be reflective of the broader Jewish public at that time. And to the question about what material items might have lasted, so you know, just in the way that I think that First Maccabees, once a generation had passed, once it became a received text, it wasn't the current document, it became a kind of script, it became a guide, if you wanted it to be that, and it certainly became a kind of historical narrative. So certain things, by virtue of their survival, work to help create these collective memories. And the two most important ones for Jews were that relief on the Arch of Titus, which you can still see today, is still the emblem of the revolt. Well, you're not the only ones who think of it that way. Everybody who ever saw it thought of it that that was the point. And the other was that menorah. You know, it was a real thing. It really did go to Rome, and it stayed there for many hundreds of years. It was on view. The emperor Vespasian built a special museum for it in his forum called the Forum of Peace. <laughs> <laughs> to the Romans, that was not an irony. <laughs> and the menorah was the centerpiece of the Temple of Peace. Those fractious, rebellious Jews, they are not a problem anymore. Here is their symbol. And everybody could go and see it. And where did it go after Rome? It went to Constantinople. It was around for a long time. The reason we have it as a symbol today is because of that. <laughs> yes? In the original picture that you have of all of those jars and cooking vessels, and they all come from Ghana. And um, I think you mentioned that traditionally there were a lot of what you call Jews in Ghana, and you carbon dated them, so you knew somebody carbon dated them. 
Is there any way to tell whether some were used to make yogurt or cook milk and some were used <laughs> to cook <laughs> <cereal? laughs> I'm trying to pull something out here. Okay. So, 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 the, so, so, the, so, so the, que the question is about those cookie pots that are, that are part of the beautiful poster, which are not carbonated because they don't have carbon in them, but they okay. were, um, they're, they're dated by a beautiful, beautiful technique called stratigraphic archaeological excavation. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Everybody should support archaeological excavation. Um, Any cells? And, and, so so the, 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 the deep desire to try to figure out whether they kept kosher. Here is the most important thing. How would you tell the difference between the pot for milk and the pot for meat. If they don't look different, it doesn't really matter. If we could do, is there a way to do it? Yes, there is a way to do residue analysis and sometimes you can identify if there are certain kinds of chemicals that are associated with, with oils or with milk or something like that. But so what? So what? If you can't tell the difference between any of these pots and you might use the wrong one, then you're not keeping kosher. So, I mean, I remember my own mother, I, we had four sets of dishes, right? We had milk and dip, we had it, and then we had for Passover. Exactly, the whole schmear. So, they didn't have that. They didn't have that. They didn't have that. Well, you would just see which dishwasher was discovered in. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't use milk. Other types of questions, please. <laughs> I tried. Uh, in Herod's period, they were killing, murder, and putting on stakes and like that. Wasn't that the normal procedure to punish the convicts and to control the land, the population? Yes, Alexander Janaeus crucified thousands of people, Jews, that, who made trouble. Alexander Janaeus, the Hasmonean king. It's kind of standard mm -hmm. operating procedure in those days, right? Yeah. I mean, some were better, some were worse. Herod stood out. Everything he did was epic. Including that, but yes, it wasn't so much. I mean, now we have the rehabilitation is our main goal. Yeah, well. But in those days, there was no such thing. Just get rid of it. Uh, oh, uh, mm, well, you mean like jail, prison, prison time? Oh. Well, Socrates was in prison, but I mean there were prisons. Not here. Elsewhere. I'm really struck by the stone vessels and the clay lamps that are all um, associated with the land. I mean, the land of Jerusalem in these lamps, and then the stone itself as perhaps not necessarily Jerusalem, but as a very distinctly local material. And I wonder if you, in your work, extrapolate from this wonderful, you said these are material emblems of territory, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how those pe literal pieces of earth in the domestic context um, can help formulate an identity. There, you know, all places have different kinds of natural resources, and you know it. So your crafts people, the people who make all the things that you use in your house. So sometimes you're blessed. You live in Athens. The clay is fantastic. It's iron rich. It fires red. The glaze that comes on it is real shiny. Everybody wants it great. No clay in Israel is like that. They do, they're, they make a lot of pottery. Everybody had pottery, it was like Tupperware. You had to have it. You used it for everything. But if you wanted something nice, you had to import it. It was not possible, and everybody <laughs> knew it, to make a table vessel that um, had a good, smooth finish. There just wasn't clay that was ever fine. Around Jerusalem and in Samaria and in some places in Galilee, there is, however, something that's natural and beautiful, and that's limestone. It's a fine grain, very, very hard, very beautiful limestone. Anybody who has been in Jerusalem on an evening when the sun is going down and seeing all that stone turning pink, that is Jerusalem stone. It's rare to have local stone that beautiful. Everybody built things from it. They quarried it. They quarried caves out of it. They knew about it. But this is the only time that they make um, vessels out of it. So I, I do think that um, 
If you're a craftsperson and you're looking around for something that you don't have to get from someplace else, but that can stand up to the beauty of some of those important things, the only logical choice is your space that stone. And you can add one thing? I was actually struck, it's great that you brought up Jerusalem Stone, was when I was reading your talk and listening to it, this idea of the territorial statement, there are now, um, I mean, you can see this, like, for example, in Palo Alto, you know, I don't remember where exactly, but I was walking through Palo Alto one day, and you see, you know, all these high-tech houses, and people are very large and fancy houses, and all of a sudden, there's one made out of Jerusalem stone. Wow, they brought it over. They over. brought it over, they brought it over to kind of make the statement. So apparently, and I've heard of friends in France that apparently wealthy French Jews are building their own houses, you know, in the countryside from Jerusalem stone. Yes. And it's, it's so dramatic in that regard. It's dramatic. And, and stone, and, and Abby, you know, I mean, just think about the use of terrazzo. Right? I mean, a distinctive stone, okay, then it makes a distinct Can you comment on the use of glass vessels. This was the area where glass was invented in the middle of the second millennium BC. Yeah, so glass, so cast glass vessels are common. Um, blown glass? Blown glass is invented around 60 or 50 BCE. We have archaeological evidence for it. In Jerusalem, we've got the blow rods stratified, so we can date them. Um, cast glass was around before. There is cast glass in Jerusalem. In the third and the second centuries, you see not very much. Um, the earliest blown, some of the earliest blown glass is found in Jerusalem. Glass does not seem to be what I would call in this regard charged. It just is. People had glass cups. When glass blowing was invented, they had glass bottles. Glass bottles were for perfume, and they started to have blown glass vases. Not so many. Um, the I showed a couple of very beautiful glass cups that were from the Akeldama tombs uh, in early first century CE. People had it, uh, but it's not, people had it in the villages, not as much as they had in Jerusalem. It was around, but it wasn't a marker of anything in particular. I, I don't think. Everything you had talked about seemed to be building toward how the artifacts that were shown showed how the Jews were kind of, well, I, don't, I don't think you said this, but like resisting through how they were having locally made products. And, and, right, okay. But then you got to the, the tombs and the funerals, and I think I understood you correctly when it sounded like they were very lavish and kind of like Roman style. So um, do we know anything, like we were talking about the ritual hand washing, do we know anything about Jewish burial rituals and when they were codified and whether the Jews who were doing that were going against laws that people already knew about or wasn't it codified yet? Well, so our, we are very fortunate to have Josephus, who is contemporary. He's first century CE. He's a Jerusalemite. He was born and raised in Jerusalem. And he notices what's going on around him and he comments on it. So he comments on what a typical Jewish funeral is supposed to be, and it's supposed to be very modest. And he specifies Josephus was a was a priest. He, he was, and he, he knew the law. And he says, you know, our laws. This goes according to the way our law is. And then he calls out the elites. <coughs> he has to call them elites. I can't remember what he calls them. And probably aristocrats, in Greek. And he says they are just show-offs with processions and speeches and. Wealthy things, and none of, and this is not the way things are supposed to be. So I think we're going to stop here for now. Uh, two things to be said. First of all, you're welcome to continue uh, your conversations and questions informally. There's some food outside, uh, and the speakers uh, are trapped here at the front, so <laughs> yeah, you've got them. Second of all, if you want some more of the same. There's tomorrow from 12.15 to 1.15, uh, right in this room. And then for those um, who pay attention to their calendars <coughs> on a much longer time frame, though not obviously as long as an archaeologist, um, back here in this room in April, we will have the second of the Leon Levy Foundation lecture series, 
delivered by Professor Laura Liebman Arnold of Reed College, who will be talking about Jews and their material culture in the early national period of the United States. So you can put that on your calendars for the spring. And now, uh, an extra uh, three times as long round of applause, I think, for Andrea Berlin.